All right. Well, hey, um, I'm glad that you're here, whether you're in person at the Synetic, you're joining us online. Um, Today is a big day for us as a church because we're going to talk about a passage where Paul is really working to shape the life of a a local community, right? Uh, I think sometimes we forget that um, these texts in Scripture were written by an actual person named Paul to an actual group of churches, in this case, the churches in the region of Galatia, which would be roughly equivalent to the central region of modern day uh, Turkey. And he wrote as a theologian, but he also wrote as a pastor. He wrote as somebody who wanted to shape what a community of faith looked like. And what we're going to see in this text is that Paul has a lot to say about life in the church. But in order to figure out um, exactly what he's getting at, um, we need to start with a very um, simple point about the scripture, probably a reminder for many of us. But when Paul sat down to write this letter, he just under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote a letter to the churches in Galatia. He didn't divide it up into chapters. He didn't put the verse headings in there. I mean, he didn't put the headings or the subheadings that sometimes introduce a paragraph of text. All of that stuff That got added uh, later. It got added later primarily just to help us organize our study of the Bible. So we're not here tonight saying, hey, we're going to talk about that section about burdens kind of towards the back end of that letter. We can say, all right, we're going to talk about Galatians chapter 5, 26 to 6, 5, and we're all together. And I'm glad those got added. They're super helpful. But we also need to be careful that we don't um, look at a particular verse or a particular uh, passage almost as if it's just a little chunk of independent fortune cookie wisdom uh, that doesn't connect to the other verses and the other passages that are right around it. And I'm thinking about that for two reasons as we get ready to talk about our passage for today. One, uh, fairly obvious, and then the other, um, take a minute to explain. But the, the first thing is, I believe uh, that Galatians chapter 5, verse 26 through Galatians chapter 6, verse 5, that's all one unified uh, thought, right? That's where Paul is writing about the communal life of the church. And even if I can't sell you on the idea that it's all one unified thought, at the very least, we can see that there is more connecting uh, verse 26 to what follows than sometimes is implied um, than it, you know, through a chapter division. So we're going to take this as one unified uh, text. But again, it's not just random thoughts about community. It's not like Paul is kind of cruising in towards the end of the letter. He's got some things to say, and he just starts kind of firing out little community axioms, little community tweets, you know, one at a time as they pop to mind. He's actually trying to build on a point that he started back in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. You may remember that from about two weeks ago when he wrote this. He said, for you, talking to the church in Galatia, you were called to be free, right? The freedom that is ours as followers of Jesus Christ, that we are free from the burden of having to earn God's forgiveness. We're free from the burden of having to earn God's love. We're free from the burden of having to earn our salvation. In fact, we can't. He's saying, hey, remember, you're free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Don't use it to justify a life of sin, but serve one another in love, right? And then Paul kind of has this conversation about the war in our soul between our flesh and the spirit and everything that played out last week. But what he's doing here is he's kind of returning to this theme of serving one another in love, and he is attempting to give very clear, very specific, very practical, very pastoral instruction about how it is that the Galatians would actually live that out. He's kind of coming back to that theme of loving service, and he's saying, okay, part of what it would take, you know, in order to live a life of loving service is you're going to need to cooperate with the work of the Spirit of God in your life as it wages war with the sinful desires of your flesh and kind of everything we talked about last week. But he's like, hey, 
You know what? That's good. That's important. Um, related idea, maybe even just another way of saying the same thing. He's like, hey, look, if you really want to be a people who live a life of loving service, you're going to have to make it the consistent practice of your life to reject pride and to deepen humility, right? That's really the current that carries this passage along, right? It's not just enough to know that pride is less than desirable and humility is a good thing. What Paul is going to urge us to do is say, yeah, 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 Uh, great that you know that, but are you consistently cultivating practices in your life that will actually lead you to reject pride and deepen humility, Or are you just paying lip service to those ideas while not actually growing and changing? And what he wants to do in this text is give us some tools that will enable us to reject pride and give us some tools that will enable us to deepen humility. So very practical message today, very practical sermon about the kind of community that we are trying to cultivate at Restoration City. We want to be a people who are known for the way that we love one another. We want to be a people who are known for the way that we serve one another. And he's saying, all right, if you're on board, step number one, devote your life to rejecting pride. Pretty clear to see where we get that out of the text. Galatians 5, 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Right? Um, It's a command. It's pretty specific. It's not even all that hard to understand. Don't become conceited. Right? When we hear the language of conceit, we immediately think about don't become prideful. Don't become arrogant. Right? Don't let yourself become just a little too full of yourself. You can all think of the friend. You know, you're like, oh yeah, man. He's awesome, and he knows it, right? You don't want to be that guy. Now, what's interesting is that the literal translation of this word, we translate it conceited, but if you were to take that word and literally translate it into English, um, instead of conceited, you would translate it as empty glory, which to me is fascinating. Right? One of the things that constantly astonishes me about Scripture is the insight that the Bible has into the reality of the human soul. Right? The insight that the Scripture has for how we work at a heart level. Because here's Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 2,000 years ago, telling the churches in Galatia and telling you and me not to settle for the empty glory of pretending to be something we're not. And he got that one before Instagram was even a thing. Right? He'd figured that out before Facebook was even on the scene. Right? He understood that we would all have something inside of us that would gravitate to what he called empty glory. That there would be something inside of us that would feel compelled to pretend to be something we're not in an attempt to impress other people. And he's saying, look, clearly that does not bode well for community, right? If everybody is just trying to impress everybody else, if everybody's just faking it, if everybody's just pretending and putting on a happy, yay, I love Jesus, even in the midst of a pandemic, I'm blessed and happy and healthy, you know, if we're just all coming together to put on an act for each other, we're never going to create a community of loving service. We're going to create a talent show and a competition and a place where people come to find judgment, not a place where people come to find life. And he's saying, yeah, clearly you can't do that. But he's also going to help us understand how pride works in our soul so that we can fight against it. He wants to give us three really quick insights into pride. Number one, he wants us to see that pride always starts with self-deception. This is where you have to take Galatians 5.26 and link it up with what Paul says in Galatians 6.3. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he's nothing, that's a direct tie back to empty glory, to don't be conceited. But if you are conceited, if you're chasing after empty glory, he deceives himself. Right, that pride gets started when we feel compelled to lie to ourselves 
about ourselves, where we feel compelled to sell ourselves on a version of ourselves that we know is not exactly true. And we do it because we don't know how to look the reality of our own soul in the mirror. We don't know how to cope with the brokenness. We don't know how to respond to our capacity for sin. We don't know what to do with our sense of grief and our sense of guilt and our sense of shame. And there's just stuff inside of us that we're so uncomfortable with that we instinctively turn away from it and we pretend it's not there. Now, obviously... Not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but you can see how Jesus starts to step into that picture and say, hey, 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 all of those things about yourself that you are so confused by and all of those things about yourself that you hate so much and all of those things about yourself that you're so bothered by, those are the very things that Jesus went to the wood of the cross to die for, right? Because of the gospel, we can finally stop running from ourselves. Because of Jesus, we can finally come out of hiding Because of Jesus, we can drop the act and stop pretending. Yes, pretending for others, but pretending for ourselves. Because of Jesus, we can finally stop being so disgusted with ourselves. We can actually talk about the reality of who we are and what God has called us to do in the world and the desires and the passions that he's given us and the unique experiences we have and our struggles and all of that kind of stuff. In other words, you don't have to fake it here. You don't have to fake it to be welcome at this church, and you don't have to fake it to be welcome in the presence of God. You don't even have to fake it to make peace with yourself. You can be honest. Now, if pride starts with self-deception, it inevitably leads to comparison. Right? The two are so closely related that you almost can't have one without the other. Right? It, it's, all, it's, it's almost like fire and air or something like that. Like the fire of pride will just die without the air of, of comparison. Right? Paul joins them together in verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another, right? Provoking is when we put a ton of effort into selling everyone else on the same lies that we're trying to sell ourselves, right? It's all the effort that we put into displaying empty glory. It's all the work that we do to try to show off and posture and convince others that we're better than we really are. And man, for some of us, one of the most freeing spiritual decisions you could make today is to stop trying so hard to be so impressive. All right, number one, you're exhausting yourself. Pretending to be something that you're not is absolutely exhausting. Trust me, I spent most of my 20s and early 30s learning that one the hard way. But not only are you exhausting yourself, you're crushing everyone around you. Because of envy. You're broadcasting empty glory. Guess what? There's people that are buying it. And you're developing this inflated view of yourself, and they're developing this totally warped, defeatist view of themselves. Right? Envy is when we choose to wallow in the empty glory of another person. Right? You, everybody has like that one person on Instagram that you essentially follow just to make you feel bad about yourself. Where you're like, yeah, man, she's got like perfect job, perfect husband, like perfect house. Looks like it just fell out of pottery barn. Like she's up doing sunrise yoga in the morning. She only makes organic food for her kid. I mean, you just, you're, you're like, you go there and you're like, wow, you know, she's just crushing it in life. And you just kind of follow her so you feel bad about yourself. And you're like, man, I've been working at home for a year trying to navigate distance learning, microwaving a lot of meals. And some days at 11 o'clock in the morning, running my teeth along my tongue to see whether or not I actually did brush my teeth. You know, and I, mm, yep, did. Okay, or at least I think I did, right? You're like, that's my life. There's laundry piling up all over our basement. And oh, you're in Cabo. Of course you are. Um, uh, you know, doing oh, yoga on the beach today, right? It, we just choose to wallow in that and feel so crushed and so defeated. All right, so Paul's saying, hey, hey, part of this game, we got to be honest with ourselves. We, we have to develop the courage to be honest about who we really are. And as we finally develop the ability to be honest with ourselves, that'll translate into the ability to be honest with other people. 
right? The part of the way that we escape this trap of pride is by living and evaluating our own lives. That's where he goes in verse 4 and 5. Let each person examine his own work. And then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with somebody else. For each person will have to carry his own load, right? What Paul is saying here is stop being so wrapped up in what God is doing with everyone else and pay attention to what's going on in your own life, right? Part of the way that we get out of this comparison game is by just focusing on the things that God has called us to do. Right? The, the real tragedy of the amount of time that we spend scrolling through other people's lives is not just that we're wallowing in envy and we're feeling terrible about ourselves, but we're missing out on an opportunity to live our own lives. We're missing out on an opportunity to do the things that God has called us to. We're liking a bunch of posts about living with significance, but we're not carving out the time to actually be a virtual tutor for a kid through CASA and do something significant, right? We don't want to spend our life just liking other people's posts. We want to live a life that we like, right? We want to live a life that's pleasing to God. We want to live a life that's faithful to what Jesus has put in front of each one of us and not be so distracted by what's going on with everyone else, right? This is basically the end of John's gospel, right? Peter denies Jesus three times. Jesus shows up. They have a little moment of fishing. Jesus cooks breakfast. He asks Peter three questions to restore him. And at the end of John's gospel, you know, Peter and the Son of God are going for a walk on the beach. Peter and Jesus go heading down the beach, and verse 20 of John chapter 21, Peter turns as they're walking, because he realizes there's a third wheel hanging behind him on the beach. Turns as he's walking. He saw the disciple that Jesus loved. That's John's favorite way to refer to himself. Not saying John is necessarily the role model right here of how to avoid a life of provoking others. He's like, Peter looks back, and he's like, oh, he saw, well, the one that Jesus loved, and you're like, okay, you know, man, he's just embracing the freedom of the gospel. Don't be snarky up there. Um, you know, you just roll with it. He's just, you know, celebrating his identity in Jesus. Okay, stick with me. Saw the disciple Jesus loved following them. The one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper. Okay, now you're just being a pain in the neck, John. Right? That's where John, he's like, hey, remember me? I'm the guy that used to lean my head on Jesus' chest the one he loved, right? Me, the one I used the son of God as a pillow, right? I would, that, that guy, he looked back and saw me and he said, Lord, who is the one that's going to betray you? Remember that I had that conversation? When Peter said to him, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? And Jesus's response is, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. Right? Some of us are missing out on so much of life because our prayer time with God, we keep pointing to somebody else. What about her? What about him? Why are you blessing her? Why is that happening? And I think what Jesus would have us lovingly hear today is, hey, what's that to you? Would you let me lead my servant the way I choose to? But as for you, follow me. Right? He's saying, live your life Stop provoking and envying everyone else. And don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. That will do a lot to sabotage pride, right? Just cut it off at the root. But that's not enough, right? If we're going to reject pride, we also need to move in the direction of humility, right? We need to deepen humility. And Paul has two very clear practices that he wants us to engage in as a community, now, in fairness, there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing going on here because both of these practices require humility to get started, but then as you engage in them more, they will deepen our humility, right? But we here, here's a little vision for the kind of church we want to be. All right, we're not, you know, just checking everything out on Instagram and liking and, sad, you know, settling for empty, shallow community. Okay, that's fine. We got to replace empty, shallow community we got to re replace provoking and envy with something. And he's like, i got an idea of what you can replace it with. Number one, why don't you devote yourself to sharing and bearing each other's burdens? 
All right, I'm going a little bit out of order, but there's a reason. I want to get um, Galatians 6.2 in front of us while we're still thinking about Galatians 6.5. Because Galatians 6.2, in the copy of Scripture that I've been teaching from more and more, the CSB translation says, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And in the CSB uh, 6.5, it said, carry each other's load. But in a lot of translations, uh, they use the same word. Right, which often leaves us in that weird spot when you're studying the Bible of like, okay, so verse 2 says carry one another's burdens. Verse 5 says everybody should carry their own burden. Which is it? What's going on? And, you know, when you run into questions like that in the Bible, you owe it to yourself to try to get an answer. Right? Don't just gloss over it and be like, I don't know, I'll just go read Psalm 23 one more time. Be like, hmm, that's weird. What's going on? Paul was not an uneducated guy. He was a really good writer. He was a really good theologian. He's not going to contradict himself three verses later and be like, oh, you should definitely share your burdens, except everybody has to carry their own burden. You've got to dig into that a little bit. You know, find a, a commentary that you trust. Bring it up in your small group. Be like, hey, I know we've got an agenda coming tonight. I know we've got things to do, but I've been wrestling with this. Can somebody help me? And, you know, maybe there'd be somebody in the group that'd be like, hey, here's the thing. You know, in verse 5, he uses a different word than the word that he uses in verse 2, right? When he says everybody's going to be responsible for bearing their own load, he uses a word that would refer to kind of a common, ordinary piece of luggage. He, he's referring to something that you would be expected to carry on your own. Like, think of your, like, your carry-on when you're flying or something. It'd almost be strange to offer to carry that. Right? Paul is a big fan of personal responsibility. He's like, look, you're going to carry the things that God has designed you to carry. But in verse 2, he uses a word that would refer to like a large trunk, something that would be impossible for you to lift on your own, right? something that you would throw your back out if you even tried to lift that thing. So Paul's saying, yeah, yeah, there's going to be things in our lives that God will give us the grace to deal with on our own. But he is also writing with the assumption that we all have some weight on our shoulders that is too heavy for us to carry alone. Yes, there are things we should carry on our own, but no, we will not be able to carry everything on our own. And for Paul, he believes that that is more often than not going to describe all of us in the church, right? Notice in verse one, he says, hey, if any of you are caught in sin, he'll, and he'll deal with that. There's no if in verse two. He's writing with the presupposition that we all are carrying something that's a little too heavy for us to adequately carry on our own. And that's a really big deal for us as a church to get comfortable with. right? Because I know a lot of you guys, and I have so much respect, and I know that there are some really strong shoulders in this church. There are a lot of really capable people. You're really good at lifting stuff, right? You're the go-to person in the office. When everybody else can't figure it out, they bring it to you, and you solve it, and you take care of it, and you're the one that makes it happen. You've gotten really good at doing it at work. You've gotten really good at doing it at home. That's your role in your family of origin, right? There's a lot of us that are pretty good burden bearers. But listen, if you carry too heavy a load for too long, you will ultimately get hurt. Right? That, that's the backstory of everybody who wakes up one day and is like, that's it. I just can't do this anymore. Career out the door, family out the door, marriage out the door, church out the door, serving out the door, volunteering out the door, everything out. The, just I can't do it anymore because we've carried way too much by ourselves for way too long. We've carried things in isolation that we were intended to carry in community, right? So deepening humility becomes fairly obvious, right? We deepen humility by being honest with each other about the burdens on our shoulders, by having the vulnerability to admit it when the load gets too heavy, which means we need to think a little bit more broadly about burdens, right? We need to think about the spiritual burdens that we carry, right? We need to think about the emotional, the relational, the financial 
burdens we carry. We need to think about pressure at work. We need to think about help around the house. We need to think about the places in life where it feels like we can't quite bear up under the weight that's on our shoulders, wherever that weight is coming from. And we need to find the humility to say to other brothers and sisters in Christ, look, this may sound silly to you, but I don't know that I can carry this any longer. And then how amazing to be a part of a community where it's not only safe to say that, but you can say that with the expectation that somebody's going to come alongside you and say, oh, could I help you lift that a little bit? They're not going to do it all for you. Right? It, th- this isn't somebody taking 100% of your burden and absolving you of the responsibility and being like, hey, you go run and play and I'll just figure out this mess for you. Right? Think, think about it more in terms of somebody spotting you when you're bench pressing at the, the gym. So, so I've heard. I, I read books. Uh, right? but, but in theory, right, the idea is you're there, you're lifting the weight. They don't lift the whole thing for you. They usually do it with two fingers. Right? Just kind of just, just help just a, just a little bit. Right? That's our role in the church. To come alongside one another and be like, man, you are straining under that. Let me, just, let me help you a little bit. Now, sometimes you're under a weight that is about to crush you, and a whole team of people need to come alongside and be like, no, we're just going to lift this thing off of you. Here's the thing. This whole burden-bearing thing, it's way more art than science. Right? Because it depends on the person, and it depends on the burden, and the situation, and the circumstance. Right, so I don't know that I can give you the definitive guide to burden bearing. probably starts with being a pretty good listener and saying, hey, could you tell me what's going on in your life? It certainly involves praying. And then it involves the Spirit of God leading us to be like, okay, here's what it looks like for me to give you a little spot right now. Here's, here's how I can help you a little bit. All right, but we don't need to wait for the definitive guide. We just need to hear the voice of God saying, hey, you really are in this together. Right? We need to be better as a church about sharing our burdens. We're really pretty good at faking it. We're really pretty good at being like, I got this. I, I got it all under control. It's who I am. I'm competent. This is who I've been my whole life. I'm good at getting stuff done. A lot of Enneagram 3s in the room, if that language means anything to you. A lot of us are just good at getting stuff done. And we need to be better at saying, hey, I'm overwhelmed. Right? But, but we don't need to just say that as sort of like this desperate, futile plea. You're like, no, I'm part of a spiritual family. I'm part of a community. Right? And we're not linked by a YouTube channel. We're not linked by the fact that we're in the same room at the same time on a Sunday. No, I mean, we're linked by the fact that we've made some commitments to one another to be like, when you're in trouble, I'm there for you. And when you need help, I'll be there. And look, in Paul's mind, that is so vital to a New Testament community. But in some ways, it's also a little bit of a warm-up act to where he really wants to go, which is confessing and restoring when somebody's overtaken by sin. All right, verse 1. It's kind of how he starts this whole thing off. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit watching out for yourself so that you also won't be tempted. If we can't share our burden, we're never going to confess our sin. And if we can't say, here's how I've been overwhelmed in the last month, we're certainly not going to say, here are all the ways that I've failed to love my wife as Christ loves the church. If we can't ask for help, we're not going to say, hey, here are specific ways that I have seen anger in my soul and how I have expressed that anger unlovingly to my children. We're just, we're not going to be able to get there. So in some ways, we got to do this burden sharing and bearing thing. If we're going to get to where Paul knows we're going to find this ultimate freedom for our soul and of being able to confess our sin to one another being able to restore one another when sin comes into our lives as it does inevitably for all of us. Right? That again, if, if this is not a place where you need to hide, it also means this is a place where you can be real about what the specific sin of your life looks like. Not so that you can be beat up, not so that you can be judged. Not so that you can be gossiped about, 
not so that you can be condemned, not so that everybody can look down on you, not even so you can have a cathartic emotional experience, but so that you could be restored gently. The language of restoring is the language of setting a broken bone. That's what Paul has envisioned here. He's like, sin has got, it, it, it broke something. You dislocated a joint. You, you broke a bone. And the job of the community of faith is to come in and lovingly set the bone. Right? And only humble hands can set spiritual bones. That's a tremendously vulnerable thing. Not to just say, hey, I need to get this off my chest. But to say, hey, I want to tell you what brokenness looks like in my life because I'm going to ask you to be a tool of Almighty God to help set that bone a little bit. Could you help me be a better husband? Could you help me be a better father? Could you help me love my neighbor better? Could you help me in my battle for sexual purity? Could, could you help me be less bitter? Man, who wouldn't want to be a part of that kind of community? And, and, and that's what Paul's calling us to. He's like, hey, that's the work of the church. To be a place where we set spiritual bones to be a place where we bear one another's burdens, to be a place, going back to verse 13, where we lovingly serve one another. Where he's like, look, if you're trying to impress everybody, you're not going to serve anybody. If you're lost in a sea of pride, you'll never be able to get to the good stuff. The last thing, this we just don't need churches that are sitting around being like, oh, yeah, bear burdens, confess sin, but we never kind of get there because we can never kind of get over ourselves. Right? That's the obstacle today. We've got to get over ourselves and our empty glory and be like, all right, I'm just going to go all in and actually treat the church not as an event I attend, but as a community I'm a part of. This mutual web of relationships where we care for one another. There's a phrase in leadership circles. You've probably seen it. You probably have posters in your office back when we all went to offices. It says something like, check your ego at the door. Right? It's kind of one of those common things, right? It's good. I like check your ego at the door, right? Check your ego at the door is how you make better decisions and become a better leader. Pretty good way to move towards a life of loving service. It's how we deepen community. I'm all for it, right? I like it. But it's not really the message of Christianity, and the message of Christianity is better than, hey, let's all just agree to check our ego at the door. The message of the gospel is to check your ego at the cross. That's what Paul is calling us to. Because listen, we resort to self-deception because we can't handle the truth of who we are and of what we've done. We love the comparison game because it masks our insecurity and it helps us avoid the difficulty of our own lives. We hide our sin from one another because we're convinced deep down that if somebody really knew what we were going through, they wouldn't love us. We pretend to have it all together because we're terrified that we just might ask for help and nobody would come running. But all of that gets answered and the cross of Christ. Right? The record of our wrongs nailed to the cross through the hands of the one who is the son of the living God. All of our insecurities and fears answered by the promise of a God who says he will never fail us. And the God who says, I'm never going to forsake you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you. I'm for you. And if God is for us, what could be against us? All that guilt, all that shame, there therefore is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All of our desperate attempts to hold it all together, answered by 
Paul in Colossians 1 where he tells us that it's Jesus who holds all things together by the power of his word. And answered by Jesus in Matthew 11 who says, Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. You don't have to hold the whole thing together because you're not really holding it together in the first place. It's Jesus holding it together. So maybe we can even take some burdens off our own soul tonight. Realize you don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to hide. You don't have to be afraid that God will ever leave you because he won't. And you can just rejoice in what Paul has been talking about in this letter, the freedom of the gospel. That God sent his only son to die in our place so that we could be fully alive. So let's pray. Father, you need to do something, God, in our souls that we could respond to this word. God, you need to give us the grace that we need to actually treat each other this way. Father, we need you to give us strength, we need you to give us courage. God, some of us in this church are going to have to take the first step of sharing our burdens. God, somebody's going to have to go first in confessing sin. Maybe even right now, God, you would just be nudging people in that direction. giving them a sense that they're going to push the envelope in their small group meeting this week. They're going to be the one that you use to lead groups to a new day of vulnerability and authenticity. God, in those moments, would you give us gentle hands? Help us to love each other well, God. Help us to bear one another. Help us to trade the empty glory of self for the eternal glory of Jesus. Because it's in his name that we pray. Amen.